I want to have you talk about the Cosmoetica located poems. Uh, is the reason for there not being more due to technical limitations? And if not, why aren't certain poems on there? As well as the fact that uh, there are, are great poems that most of your readers haven't seen, like Nat Turner's Mind, unless they have a copy of True Life, which most don't. But talk to me about the Cosmoetica located poems. Do you consider most of them your greatest verse? And also, what kind of technical limitations mar you from getting some of the other ones? Because some of your poems span through the, use the whole page and would be impractical on the format of Cosmoetica. Yeah, I would have to, a lot of the poems, uh, especially like some of the painting poems, uh, uh, technically you, keep, uh, you can't do it. I would have to put up a PDF of it. Um, and I don't want to put up every goddamn poem. I mean, I think on Cosmoetica, I probably have 70 to 80 poems up. I have another 10 to 20 on other websites. So I've got probably somewhere between 80 to 100 poems online. Anyone who Googles Dan Schneider poet or poetry or poems, uh, for example, my poem Big Red, uh, I don't think I have on Cosmoetica, but it, it is available elsewhere. So there are some that are available elsewhere. You know, what... Initially, the reason I made Cosmoetica was to get my poems out there. Anyone who loves poetry should just look at my poems. Any any editor should be able to go there and say, "Holy fuck, I've got to publish this guy," because there is no. I've got more great poems online than I think any other poet ever wrote. Even Rilke, who I think has the most great poems published ever. Um, but I mean, so I have like the Sonnets, the Beast of Year. I have my miscellaneous poems, my Skyline poems. And I've got, there are, there are probably four or five Skyline poems that I don't have online, because again, I don't want to give it all away kind of thing. The 49 Gallery, I have, I think, six or maybe seven of those poems out of the 49. American Imperium, uh, you know. So I, I, they, are, they are almost all great poems. I mean, if I look at my sonnets here, and I look at the sonnets, let's say I've got the Bella Kiss poem, Stevens on Safari, The Passings, The Rape of Mary, Your All Desire. If you just read these five first sonnets here, I mean, anyone who's an appreciator of sonnets would be like, should be like, oh my fucking God, I, 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 I've got to unzip because my cock is bursting through. I mean, I mean, you look at that. I mean, the, the Kiss poem is, is, I mean, here's a perfect example. It's a poem Kiss. This should be a love sonnet, right? No, it's on Bella Kiss, the serial killer from the early 20th century. Stevens on Safari. I have the Wallace Stevens in a Stevensian-like sonnet, you know, talking about being on Safari, you know, from the ba from a bower glow and the cat brings forth the death of youth, this love of clear vision. The passings, speaking of Carl Sagan's, uh, that, you know, the, the, the giant glowing red, that's from directly a uh, memory of watching Cosmos. The Rape of Mary here, about uh, Mary the Virgin Mother. This is a great comment on religion. It's a great, it's a great comment on sexuality about male, female. You are all desire is is uh, one of the great love poems ever written. Uh, and then you know, onward and upward in, in so many different ways. I mean, I've got you know five. I probably got about sixty sonnets alone just on, on that page. Maybe I have over a hundred poems or whatnot. Uh, so. How much more do I need to put on for anyone who's a real esthete? Uh, if you're a real poetry lover, look at the fucking poems I've got online. You know, I and you, you know, I, I was just and I'm going to hold up another thing here. I, Jessica had me watching this. I've got, I'm holding up a DVD for starting out in the evening. Uh, I'm going to review this. It's a bad film made in 2007 with Frank Langella and Lily Taylor. It's a it's got an abominable screenplay, but well acted. Langella and Lily uh, Taylor are both good actors, and they do well in in very poorly written roles. But it's got all the cliches about writers and all the cliches about uh, things. Um, but this is the kind this is the kind of mindset you're dealing with. It does a good sense of showing the idiotic mindset. I mean, the the guy, for example, who I told you thought Wallace was such a great writer. If you, if I, if you put all of my poems before him, he wouldn't understand it. Uh, you, this is one of the reasons again why I do this. Uh, you know, but I can't put out my whole corpus. Uh, not number one, I don't have the fucking time. But why would I want to do that? I mean, uh, if 
if putting out just two or three percent of it and uh, among the very best that I've got and certainly better. I mean, who the hell who the hell's out there now in the last 40 years that has published anything? I mean, if you took the worst of my poems that are online on Cosmoetic or elsewhere, you'd be lucky to if, if you could discern which is the worst of the poem to find, you know, 10 poems online by anyone alive and, and publishing today that would even come close to that. Maybe you'd get a couple that you could argue are within spitting distance of the worst of them. But, I mean, come on. So I can't... That I can't... is one of the things that readers should do with your work, though, is compare which ones work and why some fail in tiny ways. Because almost all, all the poems on Cosmoetica, at least, there are a few that you have in collections that are, are below your usual standard. But there are some on Cosmoetica that you can pick apart and see well, why is this a perfect poem and also great? And why is this one merely arguably great? And these are the type of things that the fellow on that interview on Develop Greatness would not be able to get, uh, let alone be able to discern why your poetry and prose is superior to David Foster Wallace's. Um, I'm, I'm just not looking here. For example, um, uh, here, here's a good example of a poem that uh, is not a poem that you would uh, necessarily think is great. Uh, and it's called Tallulah Bankhead to Death, 1968. Now, Tallulah Bankhead was a big movie star in the golden days of Hollywood. And it's basically her talking. You know, she's talking about, fa I fail on myself. And it ends with, with her saying, I really loathe this life at times, especially the bastards who see my greed for living as some sinful thing. The poor dumb shits don't see God as empty. Pass the bourbon, and it ends in an ellipsis. So uh, it's not something that technically is, is as bravura, but it gets right to the heart of the character. If you've never known, if you don't know who Tallulah Bankhead was, and you just read this poem over again 10 or 12 times, you'd have an idea of what this character was. Uh, and and you don't want to repeat yourself. You know, you can you can talk about well, th if something fails in this way or that way or whatnot. But you can only make those assessments if you assume that there's only one great way to write a sonnet, or if you, there's only one great way to make a film. You know, if you look and and you're saying, oh, John Cassavetes, how many? How, let me give you an example. Look at the films of John Cassavetes. I would say he has three great films. There are a couple of other films you can make arguments of having great moments or whatnot. The film that's uh, usually touted as his masterpiece, A Woman Under the Influence, is not one of his great films. It has some serious flaws. It has some uh, a few great moments and, and whatnot. But if you took the, the aesthetic that you used for Cassavetes and applied it to Stanley Kubrick, it would, it would be totally ridiculous to apply that or vice versa. Uh, so you have to realize that there are many different ways to get to something. The difference is when you're looking at my writing is I'm going to be doing things like a Kubrick or like a Cassavetes or like an Orson Welles or whatnot. And whereas Welles could only do Welles, Kubrick could only do Kubrick, Wallace Stevens could only be Wallace Stevens, uh, Hart Crane could only be Hart Crane, and Whitman could only be Whitman. I bounce around and I don't, and while you can say this is Whitmanian or this is Stevensian, they could not have written this Devensian or Whitmanian poems. I can get into those, their kind of aesthetic or milieu and, and, and do things that they couldn't do because I have them to stand on the shoulders of, but also I have that will to, getting back to the originality thing, to do something Stevensian but in a Schneiderian way. Most artists don't even have their own Schneiderian or their, you know, Bob Jones, their Jonesian way because they don't have it. They don't have that drive. They don't have that demiurge. They don't have that impulse to that. I, I am here and I'm, you know, the very reason that I write is because I am, I want to write things that are original in the sense that, that uh, people have not thought about it before. For example, if you look at when you eventually read a Norwegian in the family, it's a story about mafiosi, but it has a dwarf who's one of the main characters and he's not, a, he, and he's not, a monster, and he he doesn't shoot any one or anything. So I I put things together that 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 they work because uh, there is that negative capability of, of oh it, it would make sense for this person who's involved in say art or pornography to know a pornographer and also be involved with Andy Warhol who is the premier 
uh, indie filmmaker in New York in the 1960s. So that kind of works. Um, but most people don't think in those big, broad terms. They don't, because if you're only thinking in the small little details of an art, you're, you're likely not going to get big. People like to talk about Emily Dickinson being a visionary. No, Emily Dickinson is actually an anti-visionary in the sense she didn't have any great cosmic view. She was concerned with the little details or whatnot. Uh, and if you, there are other poets like her that, that have these, you know, little poems that, uh, uh, oh, I, there, there was a gal, Lorraine Nidecker is a good example. Lorraine Nidecker was a poet who wrote interesting little poems, but they're sort of like, uh, what's his name, Tennessee Williams, The Glass Menagerie. The, 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 these little glass figures, they don't have a, a lot of depth, but they have some nice phrase here or there. Uh, but Lorraine Nidecker could never have written a big epic poem and probably could not have written well uh, prose fiction because she, she, her, her only uh, urge was to make these crafted little things. Uh, and so... Well, when I'm, I'm talking about second-rate Snyder, that's certainly better than most first-rate great poets. Uh, when I think of a poem like The Runaway, mm. which is an arguably great poem of yours, uh, it, it, it does have flaws. It has near cliches, in, especially in some of the opening verses. But it's still a great poem, and it succeeds at what it, it wants to accomplish and goes beyond it even. What I'm talking about is, say, that you have Robert Frost's design, you compare it to your Death of a Spider, if you have a poem that's on the level of design, it does seem lesser than Death of a Spider. And I think that readers of yours should go and look into those type of things and try to compare your work to others, as well as compare your lesser work to your best work, so that they can get an in and also realize, well, he accomplishes more here, why? And start questioning these things so that they can get more insight out of it and the, engage with the art, not simply yeah. read it like a zombie. And I would say the best example of that is my American sonnets. Uh, look at the American sonnets that I have. I think I have half a dozen of them on Cosmoetic, and there's probably a few others elsewhere. But that's 154 sonnets. Each numbered sonnet has a correlate to one of Shakespeare's 154 sonnets. And I did that specifically. Sometimes I take a, a, a line and invert it from that. Sometimes it's about the general theme or trope of the, the Shakespeare sonnet. Sometimes it's a single word. There's maybe, there's a lot of a lot of chaff that Shakespeare has, but he uses one particular word interestingly. So I might use that one single word in a totally different context. And so if you compare uh, Shakespeare's sonnet 37 to my 37th uh, American sonnet, compare them and see why. And if you, I think the any, holy sonnets to John Donne's holy sonnets is also a good analog. Well, yeah, but they're they're not they're not a one to one correlation. Uh, I I they're, they're not you know my holy sonnet number thirty two doesn't correlate. But if you want an exact correlation, the that's exact and that was my impulse for doing the American sonnets. I I was like. Uh, and now th this this gets to some idiot like Harold Bloom would say, that's the fear of anxiety. No, it wasn't anxiety. It was absolute confidence. I wanted to show that, oh, you think that Shakespeare's the greatest sonneteer? Well, I can tell you, Elizabeth Bar Barrett Brown was a better sonneteer than Shakespeare. John Donne was a better sonneteer than Shakespeare. And Dan Schneider is a better sonneteer than all three of them. And I'm going to show you why. And I'm going to show you how you can do it. Because Shakespeare, as I, I had put in a recent... Uh, Asked the Ann Schneider video, didn't invent the Shakespearean sonnet form even. Uh, I have invented or shown how, how you can do at least a couple of dozen different new forms, not to mention uh, mastering the, the forms that were already there before. So that's not the anxiety of influence that are more on like how, uh, Harold Bloom. Not ha Howard Bloom is the good H. Bloom. Harold Bloom is the bad H. Bloom. Harold Bloom is the moron, the sphere of anxiety. No, there's absolute confidence. I'm saying, here, forget this Forget this 500-year-old guy who uh, had some great stuff or whatnot. Put him aside. Go, go explore and push boundaries. If you want to know how to do it, look how I went way beyond Shakespeare. Now, even if you can only do it a handful of times in your life, Pick out a poem of mine or a short story or an essay even and say, here's how I'm going to take what he's doing in this piece of writing and I'm going to go one step beyond. That's all you have to do in art is, is, is push something one step beyond. That's not originality in, in the sense that, oh, I'm coming up with something totally original. 
you know. But there are people that go in the other extreme. I was just reading someone said there was, there's this this bullshit myth. Uh, it's a meme that says you know there, there's only supposedly like I, I've read 15 or 17 or 33 types of stories out there. No, there's not, and you know this because if you've read any of my short stories, I I, I totally subvert. I, I, I don't. One of the things I try not to do is to repeat myself. Is always to try to do something different. It might not, you know, I might go be similar for 60 or 70 percent of a poem or something, but then that last 30 percent, I'll twist it and I'll do it. And, I'll, and maybe I don't twist it. Maybe I just move it to the left, push it up, you know, make it pulse like a, a strobe light or whatever. These so, whole extreme statements are idiotic because art is a bottomless well of ideas that you can contain. And the people who say those statements evidence their own ignorance of art and it's a, I mean the, you know, the there's also the statement people say oh everything that's ever been said has been said before well given that we live on a microscopic speck in the the galaxy uh, gi and given uh, hopefully if humanity survives and gets out into the cosmos not only, are, I mean, we barely begun to, to speak. We barely probed the, probed you know the communicative as soon as humans abilities. Start seeing different planets, if if they ever do, and start venturing past galaxies, there will be a whole explosion of different ideas that they'll be able to get at. And as that, well as when we elongate our mortality, and not be able to just be confined to a certain state and and time. So if humans start living two hundred years, that will move the art into completely different directions and push it further than there ever was before. Yeah. Imagine, for example, today as we're in 2016, just last year, gay marriage in, in the U.S. was legalized or something. But, you know, you have people transgender, this gender, that gender, blah, blah, blah. All, all this stuff, uh, people obsessing on their sexuality or whatnot. But imagine a, a few hundred years from now, and I'm a cyborg. Uh, you know, I, as far as I know, I have no descendants. But let's say if I had a descendant, and one of my descendants of my descendants of my descendants uh, is on some trip or whatnot, and they're not just homosexual or heterosexual or transsexual or transgender or this or whatnot, maybe, maybe, maybe they're, they're, they're no sexuality regard to human beings, but they get out and they encounter, maybe maybe they go through a, a sentient cloud of molecules or something that's the size of the solar system. And within this sentient cloud, somehow uh, it filters in through the filtration system or whatever starship I'm zip, my descendant is zipping along in. And the mindliness of this being that has maybe been floating for millennia somehow sexually arouses my cyborg descendant, and maybe, maybe, maybe my cyborg descendant uh, the gets aroused in in some way that's mechanical too. Well, how uh, how would you write about that kind of uh, a sexual arousal from uh, a a being that nowadays we would consider inanimate, uh, using uh, you know a, a way to get to to the inner person by means that we've yet to develop. These are things. These are things that you can project out. And when you look at science fiction, this is why I say science fiction is such a, ju a juvenile genre. Because even the best science fiction, even these so-called masses, Arthur C. Clarke hints at this a little bit in two thousand and one. But his way is to back away from it and, and just leave it uh, the the book and, and and the film with the oh I can't explain it the the ineffable and that's good to a certain degree. But if you want to really move something like science fiction forward, and when I do my science fiction book, I'm going to be tackling some of these things, and you have to deal with things that are beyond what is currently uh, uh, in the human experience. And that means you're going to have to make some things up. It's going to have to be fictional. But just like I said about, uh, about you know, an alternate kind of sexuality, or some, some cyber inorganic sexual turn on, how 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 could someone like me feel that? But I can I can try to imagine that most people, however, won't even think of these things. And I'll give you an example of, of this in science fiction. I'm getting off track, but I, I just want to pull it out. A fellow named Art Durkey, who was who was a friend of mine, uh, who came to the UPG, and we ha we did the Omniverska radio shows. I don't know. Have you listened to any of my Omniverska shows? I've listened to all of them. Yeah. So Art Durkey had recommended that I read this guy named Samuel Delaney. And Samuel Delaney is a black uh, homosexual sci-fi writer who got a, a fairly big reputation. His, his most well-known novel is Dolgan. I read Dolgan. 
And it was so goddamn puerile. And this is this is one of the things that gets me about about people when they write about things that not just sexuality, but it always gets down to the lowest common denominator. You know, uh, it, 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 it's it's proto cyberpunk, but it's filled with cliches. You know exactly where it's going. And it, it's basically there, there's a few gratuitous uh, sex scenes between a, a couple of the male characters, I believe. And it's so boring because it's so predictable. It's as predictable as that goddamn Western novel where the cowboys are just riding around looking for horses. And and so, so if you're going to write about, if, if you're going to hold up, for example, that sexuality, especially in this day and age, is is this is this thing that has been overlooked and it's such an important part. Well, treat it like it. Don't treat it like a goddamn eight or ten year old infant. I was arguing just recently with this moron on uh, uh, this uh, website, this IMDb board, and he. What really pissed me off was is. Uh, one other poster he was arguing with was talking about the aesthetics of, of, of the human body, male versus female. And I pointed out, for example, that that generally speaking, the female body is more aesthetically pleasing because women have more fat on their bodies, their curves are gentler, they look cuter because this this makes generally their faces, their, their uh, you know, where as if you look at a man, uh, a man uh, is going to be generally more cut. Yes, if you have a fat slob, it's not going to be. But, you know, if you look, I, I, I use the example of, of foot fetishists. I've known a few foot fetishists, and I've known gay foot fetishists and straight foot fetishists, and all of them will admit a female foot is more aesthetically pleasing because the fat covers up the sinew, it covers up the blood vessels, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the, this gay guy who was arguing with this other guy went into this whole thing where he was accusing me of being childishly accusing me of attacking him for being gay. I said, no, you're simply wrong. And it's, this, this, it, had nothing, it had nothing to do with, with his, his, his uh, homosexuality, but his puerile sexuality and his inability to distinguish an aesthetic argument from a sexual argument because all he had to do was bring it down to sexuality. And that's what this, this Dahlgren novel does. And this is what all genres do, is they bring things down to the lowest common denominator because God forbid that a person could have two or three or four levels. When I'm writing, I give my characters usually half a dozen levels, even if they're a passing character, a fleeting character that only appears in half a page. But well, using a filming example, you don't really think of 2001 or Once Upon a Time in the West as great science fiction or great westerns. You think of them simply as great films because they are able to project outward. They're not confined by their genres, but are using the genre only as a means to express other ideas. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and and that's why 2001 is simply put the most non pareil at least science fiction film of all time. Solaris uh, is 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 makes a good case for it. Uh, the original one by uh, Tarkovsky, but it's not quite up there with Kubrick. It's not quite as ineffable, but both of those films can be bettered. And the way to better them is to do something, as I said, is to, 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 take, to take what's out there uh, and project outward. Don't be scared to go out on a limb. Now, that's not going to happen in Hollywood nowadays. Uh, hopefully, uh, there will come a period where some filmmaker... Uh, maybe gets a reputation and gets a film and, and gets the backing to do something. But it's not going to be someone like a Christopher Nolan, who's just a fucking hack. I mean, yeah, Memento was a great film, but everything he's done since then, he's just, he, he, I'm, I'm going to fragment it. I'm going to fragment it. Look at all these fucking guys. Tim Burton, ju he's juvenilely arrested. Ron Howard, you know, go back to fucking Mayberry with your shit. Steven Spielberg. You know, I mean, all of these people, they, 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 have, they have the minds of three-year-olds, and this is what people want. Because realistically, just like, you know, voters get the, the candidates they want, we get the art that most of us want. And most people nowadays are lazy motherfuckers who don't want good art. They don't want to be challenged. They, they say, oh, life is so tough. I just want to come home and relax. I want to watch Batman versus Superman, Dick Wars 17. Fuck that. You you don't get anything. You know, this is this is like this is the equivalent of someone who wants a blow up doll rather than a real person that they can communicate with. Because God forbid that real that real person might say, you know, maybe you should do this or that with your life. Maybe you should look at it from this point of view. No, I just I just want to suck on plastic uh, tip. <laughs> What the That's fuck is one that? One of the things that marred Stanley Kubrick in his day is that it's hard to relax in any of his films. Whereas 
with Batman versus Superman or these other assorted superhero abominations that aren't even at the level of, you know, the Flashman cartoons or, or, or the old Adam West Batman or any of these sillier versions of the characters, which actually, <laughs> I say sillier, but more uh, consciously humorous, I, I should better say, right. because the, the serious, overly dark superhero crap is even sillier than the Adam West stuff and more parody level. Yeah. Whereas Adam West was consciously doing humorous bits when he's going and figuring out whether where he can put the bomb so it doesn't yeah. explode in his hands. That's obviously not something that is taken with great seriousness. But it doesn't seem like people want to be challenged. They don't want to go watch Eyes Wide Shut. They want to go watch the, the latest event movie that will say nothing to them. Yeah, and you know, I, you're speaking of this because I had sent around to you and a few other people this this guy on this IMDb board, another guy who was who was talking about, oh, he, he he felt an obligation to go to see a movie he felt was bad, this latest Batman Superman movie. Why? And his reasons for it was, well, it, it basically just came down to I'm a drone. I mean, the the unfortunate is I'm just a drone. I, I I've been conditioned to go and see these movies. You know, oh, they're rebooting Spider Man. Oh, uh, Iron Man, Iron Man Seventeen, the battle against Rust. You know, uh, and I don't buy the explanation you say because you say that this is a teacher. If this is a teacher, it's disgraceful that he goes off and isn't bettering himself because then he's warping the youth's mind too by not getting them to challenge themselves as well. Yeah, and, and 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 but the sad thing is, he's one of the smarter people on on like your typical IMDb board. Most of them are these trolls, like this gay guy who can't, who, who just wants to, you know, see uh, uh, guys walk around in towels all all show. Um, most of them are these people who, uh, uh, you know, just want to see these simple minded love stories. I mean, you know, the lowest the lowest form of art is melodrama. Or at least the lowest form of drama is melodrama. But that doesn't mean that you can't have good melodrama. There have been good soap opera moments that I've seen. 